أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولقد آتينا إبراهيم رشته من قبل وكنا به عالمين إذ قال لأبيه وقومه ما هذه التماثيل التي أنتم لها عاكفون قالوا وجدنا آباءنا لها عابدين قال لقد كنتم أنتم وآباؤكم في ضلال مبين قالوا أجئتنا بالحق أم أنت من اللاعبين قال بل ربكم رب السماوات والأرض الذي فطرهن وأنا على ذلك من الشاهدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي والحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله تعالى وبركاته um, today i'm going to continue my discussion with you about the passage in surah al-anbiya about ibrahim alayhi salam that's from ayah number uh, 51 onwards there are a couple of things even though i'm not doing an in-depth tafsir study of this with you we're taking a kind of a survey look and making observations about some of the highlights in the passage. There are lots more that I'm skipping, but some things, you know, I think even in this series deserve attention. So I'm going to bring them to your attention, inshallah. Starting with an ayah number 51, something I didn't talk about to you before, Allah said, وَكُنَّا بِهِ عَالِمِينَ So the rough translation of the whole ayah is, we had already given Ibrahim alayhi salam his guidance, his uprightness, and we were fully aware of him. Or in fact, because bihi is muqaddam, you would say, we were the ones, in fact, that were fully aware of him, as if no one else was aware of him except we were. And this is an important subtle thing that in the text of the Qur'an, because the story of Ibrahim salam is known. And even the Quraysh who used to worship idols used to claim that they are following the religion of their father Ibrahim salam. So the attribution of to Ibrahim salam was done even by the mushrikun. That's why they made a big deal out of the Kaaba. That's why they were already still sacrificing the animal. That's why they were even, the, the ritual of Hajj already existed even before the coming of the Prophet ﷺ. So this stuff was already there because in a twisted way, they were thinking in their mind, they're still following the religion of Ibrahim ﷺ. On the other side, there's also this, the two other audiences of the Prophet ﷺ, which is predominantly in Medina, but in a subtle indirect way also in Mecca, the Jews and the Christians both of whom have a direct contact or direct uh, affiliation with Ibrahim alayhi salam. And when Allah says, وَكُنَّا بِهِ عَالِمِينَ It's as if He's taking a, a very direct, subtle but direct jab at all three and saying, you're not the ones who know about Him, we do. He's reclaiming the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And He's saying, we're the ones who know about it, as if to say, whatever I'm about to say is the real account of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And this is something as a student of the Qur'an, Anybody who's going to study the Qur'an seriously should know that the Qur'an is reclaiming existing stories. So the story of Jesus already existed in the world before the coming of the Qur'an. The story of Moses existed. The story of the young people of the cave existed. These stories existed with their variations and they were popular among the people. And Allah said, you may have the names right, but all these other details you've corrupted. And you've turned the story into something else entirely. Right? And... We're pretty familiar nowadays with the idea that there's a news event and then news media organizations know how to spin that event and turn it into something else. So you don't know what the actual, even if they have the footage and they have the, you know, they've got the, the, the names and the dates and the, the, the documents and all that stuff is in order, but how they weave that together can turn it into a completely different story. And the Quran is actually making a very bold claim that it's taking charge of those stories again. It's retelling the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam as if to say this is the original account and anything that corresponds with this, with what you have, is worthy of keeping. And anything that conflicts with what this is, is, is to be removed. Because this is setting the record straight. You know, this is one of the names of the Qur'an, وَمُهَيْمِنًا alayhi, That it serves as a guardian over what came before it. It came to secure the truth in what's in it and to filter out the corruption that had been added in. So now with that in mind, that, that's one thing that I wanted to, to say about, you know, the, the, the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. It comes to a prophet, 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is not the graduate of a seminary, he didn't get a formal education, and yet the words that were given to him are challenging people that have established churches and synagogues and monasteries and have traditional, you know, uh, scholarly studies of centuries and centuries and centuries. And in just one ayah, Allah is crushing their, their scholarship and saying, no, we're the ones who know. وَكُنَّا بِهِ عَالِمِينَ Right? And then Allah is talking about things that aren't even found in their literature. So that's one thing that I wanted to bring to your attention. The second thing is actually now today what I wanted to talk to you about is the response of Ibrahim salam when they said, we found our fathers worshipping this. And last session, before my, uh, my, my, my tangent talk yesterday, last session on Ibrahim salam, I talked to you guys about how we have to identify what those forefathers represent in our day and age. And you know we can't. We have to read that historically, and then we have to see it, well, how that applies in our day and age. But today we're going to go back to the era of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And what I want to highlight to you is how Ibrahim alayhi salam responded to them. He said, "Qala," when they said, "We worship these gods, these idols, because we found our fathers and their fathers and their fathers doing exactly this, and they were worshiping these. So of course we're going to show, you know." We're going to show adoration and, and devotion to these idols. In other words, our worship, our, our respect for this religion that we follow isn't just because we follow this religion, it's out of respect for our ancestry and our heritage. So now, in, in a sense, they've actually mentioned another god. right? So there's the god that they worship, but another god, the source of this god is my, my affiliation to my tribe, my people, my history, and that's why nationalism, tribalism, right? Your race, uh, your, your ancestry, that can also become a god of, of sorts. A culture can become a god of sorts. How do you know if a culture or a race or a nation has become a god? When that overrides the truth. When that overrides revelation, it overrides reason, it overrides morality. My culture says this, so that's how we're going to do it. And you know what? We Muslims have to be afraid of that. We have to be afraid of, because Muslims, we're not just purely Muslims. We come from a culture. We come from a South Asian culture, or an African culture, or a European culture, or an American culture. Culture is a part of human identity. It's, you can't escape it. You know, it's, it's, it's how our personalities are formed, how our families are formed, how societies are organized. So Islam didn't come to get rid of culture. Islam didn't come and say, oh, your culture is bad. No, Islam actually recognized the, the, the varieties of cultures. However, there will be points in every culture, there will be elements of every culture that go directly against the teachings of Allah and His Messenger. Or historically, the teachings of Allah. They'll go against Tawheed, for example. They'll go against the unity of Allah. They'll go against principles of justice. You know, ancient Arabian culture had this thing about daughters being a shame. If you have a daughter, it's a shame on you. You weren't man enough to have a son, and that's why you had a daughter, right? So that's part of their culture. It's something to be looked down upon, you know? And the, the guy is hiding his face, not showing it in public. Quran captures that element of their culture, right? So now when there are parts of any culture that conflict with what Allah has given, or what with the with fitra, with with justice, with truth, and we still hold on to that culture, then that culture is higher than the word of Allah. And that culture is a kind of God. Then the culture is being worshipped. Then nation is being worshipped. Right? So they, they can become objects of worship. Just like we talked about yesterday, there are other, or last session, there are other kinds of ob objects of worship. They they mentioned one themselves. They said, you know, we do this because our ancestors did it. Our fathers did it. We, there, there's no way we're going to go against what our fathers did. Now Ibrahim alayhi salam's response. لَقَدْ كُنْتُمْ أَنْتُمْ وَآبَاؤُكُمْ فِي ضَلَالِ مُبِينَ No doubt about it. I swear by it. You already, all of you. And then he mentions كُنْتُمْ أَنْتُمْ There's, there's two, two yous in there. And then وَآبَاؤُكُمْ And all of your ancestry فِي ضَلَالِ مُبِينَ Have obviously been lost all along. You've been lost. What are you proud of? A, her a, a heritage of ignorance? This is what you're proud of? So he directly attacked them, their elders, their heritage, all of it all together. When it comes to this, he's aggressively anti this entire, th this entire culture. By the way, this is the same Ibrahim alayhi I want you to understand the, the contradiction here. The two op opposing forces. 
Ibrahim, this is the same Ibrahim alayhi salam who's concerned about the well-being of all of humanity. This is the same Ibrahim alayhi salam who even when his father is kicking him out, is going to say, I'm going to be praying for your forgiveness. So it's not like he's harsh against the people. So then where, what's all this aggressiveness? Then how do we understand this aggressiveness and his concern for people at the same time? He's aggressive against falsehood. And when falsehood is being justified and you're leaning on it by way of, well, that's how we've always done it. And that's how our family's done it. And that's how we've been doing it for generations. Well, you know what? Then your generations were entirely wrong. He's not going to hold back from being offensive when it comes to the truth. Even if he cares. It's called tough love. And as a young man, he was, he, he was daring enough to question that. You know, لَقَدْ كُنْتُمْ أَنْتُمْ وَآبَاؤُكُمْ فِي ضَلَالِ مُبِينَ this is called in, in Balagha studies. I'll, I'll use the word Balagha a lot for those of you that aren't familiar with Arabic terminology. Balagha is the science of analyzing the, the, the communication techniques in the language of the Quran. Devices that are being used, elements that are being used in the language that create special effect in the meaning. And Balagha is the, an aspect of the Arabic language that when you're translating the Quran, you don't see it much. Like you can translate the words, you can be mindful of the grammar but you can't translate certain things. To give you an easy appreciation of that in English is sometimes you can translate what somebody says, like a transcript of somebody's speech, but you can't translate their tone, right? You can't translate if they were saying that sarcastically or they were saying it angrily or they were, because the text is the text, right? Like I often give the example of the word okay. The word okay could mean okay. It could also mean die. It could also mean, well, you'll find out when you get home. It could also mean try that again. You know, it could be a threat, it could be sarcasm, it could be the farthest thing from okay and somebody says okay. I mean, my way of deciphering that is okay versus okay full stop in a text message. When it's full stop, it's a threat, I would assume, you know. <laughs> so there's a hostility in the full stop that I just don't assume inside the... Or uh, obviously we have all caps, right? All caps means you're screaming, okay, shut up already, you know, or something like that. Or if it's, not, if it's not such a disarming, okay, if it's not such an aggressive, okay, you can say okay a couple of times, like, okay, okay, okay. That means, okay, I'm not, I'm not being aggressive. You know, it could be, I don't know, these are my readings. <laughs> but the point is, there are, there are aspects of language that are not communicated simply with the text. There are aspects of language that, that have to do with tone, intonation, context. Arabic is so rich that even inside the text, it can capture some of those things, and that's balagha. Right, so part of the aspects of Balagha here is something called what's what's happening ins inside of this ayah is called khabar inkari. Khabar inkari is a kind of speech that's used when you're talking to someone who you are saying is absolutely wrong. They have a certain claim, and you're being aggressive and hostile towards them in your response to that claim. So Ibrahim alayhi salam isn't just saying something offensive; he's saying it in a very offensive way. You people, you've always been, and not only you've always been, your fathers have always been. Drowned in, in, in confusion. And, and fi, even fi dhalalim mubin is actually pretty heavy language. You know, qad dhallu, qad dhalaltum, you have, you have been lost. But fi dhalalim mubin, it's like you, that's all you've ever been in. You're, 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 you're drowned in it. This is all you breathe in. All around you is just confusion and misguidance. That's all it is. And it's so obvious. And the word mubin actually adds insult to injury. Because when something is obvious, you should be able to see it. Like you're obviously doing something wrong. How stupid are you? Is, is embedded inside the word Mubin. So he's really going out of his way and being offensive now. And so when they heard a young man, maybe he's a preteen, maybe he's 13, 14, we don't know his exact age. Maybe he's a 12 year old. And he's talking in this tone. Obviously they're not going to take him too seriously, right? They're like, look at this kid. He's getting all fired up, making a scene. So they said, Oh, you, you have the truth? You came with the truth? Did you? You came with the truth. Huh. How cute. And then they offer another alternative. Am anta min al Or are you from those that are playing around? So listen to this language. Did you bring the truth? Or are you from those that are playing? Are you from playing around? But again, balagha plays a role. أَجِئْتَنَا بِالْحَقِّ is فِعِ الْمَاضِي It's a jumla fi'liya جِئْتَ أَمْ أَنْتَ مِنَ اللَّاعِبِينَ is a jumla ismiya it's a, it's, a, it's a nominal sentence and what that does is it actually puts stress on the second one so here's what they're doing 
Are you joking? Or are you, you're kidding, right? That's what you're doing. You're kidding. They put a stress on you. You must be kidding. Why? Because if even if he was serious from their intimidating tone, he's going to be like, I think they're trying to tell me that I need to change my story and say, yep, yep, sorry, I was kidding. So they're, they're trying to coerce him by the stress on um, anta mila la'ibin into accepting that and to getting intimidated. From it, we're learning something. When somebody speaks up for the truth and they're in a position of obvious weakness, Ibrahim is a child speaking up against authority and the entire society actually. He's making a public scene. He's in no position of power. Then power has a way of forcing you without having to exert its muscle. In just the way that it speaks to you, in, un, in indirect ways, it can make you surrender. You can feel the pressure from the way it's talking to you. That if I continue down this path, there will be consequences. And that's inside Am Anta Min Al Laibin. They didn't say there will be consequences, but they also said, I think you better, it's, you're better off suggesting that this was just a joke and you were just playing around and uh, you're just a kid, you know, you kids do goofy things and we're all just willing to forget about what just happened. Isn't that what you want? Like, <laughs> they're. They're, they're towering down on Ibrahim alayhi salam with this tone. And so you would think Ibrahim alayhi salam, when this happens, he's going to crumble a little bit. His, his knees are going to buckle and he's going to kind of back down. Maybe, maybe I'll take up, maybe this battle for another day. He says, Qala, he responded, Bal rabbukum rabbu samawati wal ardi. No, the fact of the matter is instead, if you think I'm kidding, in fact, I'm not kidding. The fact of the matter is that your master is the master of the skies and the earth. The one who fashioned all of them, the one who molded all of them. Why did? He, why is he mentioning the skies and the earth? Because the idols are on the earth, and their deities—the star, the sun, the moon are in the sky. He's taking all of their theology out in one phrase when he says "Rabbu Samawati, Rabbukum Rabbu Samawati wal Ardi," and then he says "Alladhi Fatarahunna," the one who molded all of them, crafted all of them. Wa ana ala dalikum min shahidin, and I am a witness against all of you. I stand by what I say, and I hold you accountable for lying. You're trying to intimidate me. He reverses this and says, actually, you're the ones who should be intimidated. This is actually a continuation of something he said in Surah Al-An'am. وَكَيْفَ أَخَافُ مَا أَشْرَكْتُمْ وَأَنَّكُمْ لَا تَخَافُونَ أَنَّكُمْ أَشْرَكْتُمْ بِاللَّهِ How am I supposed to be afraid of your false gods that you make shirk with, and you're not afraid that you do shirk with Allah? Oh, you're trying to scare me? You're the ones who should be scared. And I am a witness against you as if to say there's a trial coming and in that trial the judge, meaning Allah, will ask for witnesses. And when he asks for witnesses, I will stand there witness that I told them that these aren't gods, Ya Rab. I'm a witness against all of them. SubhanAllah. It's as if he can see the, the moment of judgment day in front of him already and it doesn't scare him what's happening in this world. Compared to the, the, the horrors that are coming, this is nothing. These people are going to be powerless, if not today, then tomorrow. So, وَأَنَا عَلَى ذَلِكُمْ مِنَ الشَّاهِدِينَ And then, which I'm going to, inshallah, explain to you uh, in tomorrow's session, he openly says it. Some people say that he said this kind of um, under his, uh, uh, like an undertone, as he's walking away, as they laughed him off. They didn't take him seriously because he's a kid. He said what he had to say. But we don't know if he said this out loud and openly. The text isn't very you know, explicit about that. Or as they're walking away, he kind of clinches his fist and says this. But let's read what he says. Watallahi, and I swear by Allah. Watallahi. Now in Arabic, when you swear by Allah, you say wallahi. You say wallahi. But when you swear by Allah and you are really enraged, then you resort to tallahi. Tallahi is extremely serious. It's, it's, got, it's charged with emotion. You don't say that under normal circumstances. In fact, wallahi, Arabs say it under very normal circumstances. It could be something so trivial and they can still say wallahi. You know, they, they will say wallahi when it's not even needed. Like wallahi, that ice cream was good. Wallah. Wallah is so good. Wallah, strawberry. Wallah. Like they go, they go wallah everything, right? And that's okay. That's part of the culture. And Allah even acknowledges that historically. And He says, Allah is not going to hold you to account for you know, your, the oath that you took because you were just you know, shooting the breeze. You're just talking, you're just smack talking, and you don't really mean it. Now, from years ago, I gave the same example. I said, a couple of friends are hanging out, and a friend says to their friend, Man, wallah, you better shut up, I'm going to kill you. 
Wallah. I mean, you, it's not like he took an oath by Allah and he shows up with a dagger the next day. I'm sorry, bro. An oath is an oath. This is sacred, nothing personal. That's not what this means. He just said it. You know, it, it's, you're, you're not held to account for that. But Tallahi is a different story. Rare occasions in the Quran you'll find somebody out of their rage, out of their frustration, they'll express Tallahi. And so Ibrahim alayhi salam uses it. The brothers of Yusuf used it against their father when they saw him crying years after Yusuf's disappearance. He said, Tallahi tafta'u tathkuru Yusuf? I swear to God, you're going to keep missing Yusuf? You keep mentioning Yusuf? You keep remembering Yusuf? Until you're going to die too? Get over it already. They got so frustrated that the words of their frustration were captured with Tallahi. Here, Tallahi is being used with the frustration and the rage of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And after that, Tallahi, whatever he's going to say, he means business. He says, لَأَكِيدَنَّ أَصْنَامَكُمْ I swear by it. There's no doubt about it. I will scheme and I will scheme. I got a plan that I'm going to execute for all of your idols. I'm going to deal with your idols, I swear by Allah. I got, I'm, I'm going to do this. He's made up his mind. So we don't know if he actually said this out loud and they didn't say, take it seriously. Or as they're walking away, he just kind of said this to himself. After you people turn your back. But actually, my, hint, my, my personal inclination is that he did say this out loud. The reason I would say that is because when you guys already know what happened, he smashed the idols. When they found the mess, they actually said, Oh, we saw, we remember a young man talking about them. He was mentioning them. It was, I, I think they call him Ibrahim. That's how they mentioned it. So they heard that he was issuing threats to their gods, right? And now somebody's like, I remember this one guy, kid. What was his name? Ibrahim. He was talking about them. So, Tallahi la akidanna asnamakum. This, what I leave you with is to, experience, to appreciate the deep, deep hatred Ibrahim salam has for anything placed next to Allah. How, how much it bothers him, how it enrages him. This is a man filled with love for humanity. He's, for his entire life, is filled with love for humanity. But when it comes to shirk, is there's a fire inside him. There's a rage that comes out in the text. And we, again, we call ourselves followers of the religion of our father, Ibrahim alayhi salam. And we have to develop that same disgust for anything that is placed next to our Rabb. Outside, in the physical material world, or in the world of ideas, or in the world of culture or tradition. It doesn't matter which world it comes from. When something even gets close to being placed next to my Rabb, and I have, to have a, I have to have a desire to just destroy that idol. I don't want it anywhere near me. I want to crush it and get rid of it. And if there's something inside me, I've got to break and smash those idols. I have to, if I, once I identify them, I have to have a spite towards them. This is not a spite towards myself. It is a spite towards a misguidance that might be infecting me on the inside. I have to identify it, really treat it like an enemy and go after it. And, and, and we, we, we learn that emotional kind of energetic response to protecting the, the iman in Allah from these words of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So I'll leave you with these thoughts, inshallah. We'll continue the, the, the analysis of this story tomorrow. Barakallahu li walakum fil Quran al Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyakum bil ayati wa takhakim. In fact, not tomorrow. We're going to do this after Taraweeh. So tonight's Saturday. So I'm going to do a late night session too, inshallah. Zakumallahu khayyan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.